Good morning, it's Wednesday morning. We're back to the histories, 2 Kings, chapters 18 and 19. I remember at Bible College, uh, the principal that I had at college, David Cook, used to talk about the impossible application out of a passage. Always look to a passage and think, what's the thing that I can't possibly believe if I was reading this section? And I remember him illustrating that by talking about the obvious implications when Jesus says that you can't love both God and money. Uh, you can't have two masters. You'll either love the one or be devoted to the other. And the impossible application out of that is, I'm the exception to the rule. You can love both God and money. But what if you came to these chapters? What's the impossible application out of these passages? And in a way, I think it's a similar message. It says you can't serve two masters. And that's what we see in these chapters. Um, we've come to look at Hezekiah, king of Judah. And things look good. In fact, things as they begin look great. Uh, he's the first king in a long time who's uh, doing the right thing, uh, as his father David had done. He's removing the high places, smashed the sacred stones. He's cut down the Asherah poles. It all looks terrific. He's stopped the burning of incense uh, to the bronze snake that Moses had made because even that has started to be worshipped. And so you see that he's the first king in a long time who's uh, tearing down the false idols that we've been going on and on about for week after week. And he started to show this devotion to God. Uh, hold that thought. Because the Assyrian king, Sennacherib, uh, is not happy about the situation with Israel or with Judah in particular. And he has already sent his forces and destroyed some of the Judean fortified cities. And Hezekiah is quaking in his boots, worried there in Jerusalem whether or not he will be um, the next to succumb. But instead of trusting in God, Hezekiah raids God's temple and gets all of the silver and gold again and now pays a tribute to that ruthless king. Um, you start to see already Hezekiah's allegiance is divided. Will he trust just God? No, no, no. He's going to have to buy his way out of this. And Sennacherib takes advantage of that situation. He sends a delegation of counselors to force uh, a surrender to the Assyrians and to their gods. Um, and really, in a kind of tactical move, the Assyrian delegates make sure um, that they sound like they're prophets coming to Israel. So when you look at the words in chapter 18 and verse 31, you sound, hear the echoes here when it says, Do not listen to Hezekiah. This is what the king of Assyria says. Make peace with me and come out to me. Then each of you will eat fruit from your own vine and fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you to a land like your own, a land of grain and new wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive trees and honey. Choose life, not death. Now, what does all that sound like? It sounds like one of God's prophets coming to tell God's people about the things that he's going to provide. Only this is an Assyrian king and his delegation that's trying to lure God's people. Don't listen to Hezekiah. Trust in me. Choose life and don't choose death. But of course, to choose to go with the Assyrian king Sennacherib will mean death. So Hezekiah is distressed. What will he do? He runs again to the temple, this time not to rob it again, but actually to pray. Despite the fact that Hezekiah has a divided heart, he recognizes that God's there to be approached. And in fact, God does respond to him. Isaiah the prophet uh, speaks and promises that Israel will rise from the ashes in three years. And that very night, there is a huge slaughter. 185,000 Assyrian soldiers die at God's hand. Uh, then you'll move into the next chapter. And Hezekiah, before he experiences all of that renewal, he is uh, struck by a life-threatening illness. But more of that next week. Let's just think and ponder these two chapters. Because Hezekiah, as Judah's king in the faithful city of Jerusalem, actually embodies the nation's divided heart. And remember what Jesus says? You cannot serve two masters. And Hezekiah proves that actually a divided allegiance ultimately leads to death and exile. As I mentioned last week, the clock is ticking on all of this. And so part of Hezekiah's message to us is a warning that says, don't be like me. In this, you also see that dividing your heart also divides the rescue. This idea that you can't really be half saved. There's, there's these patterns that either they are at home in God's land, living in his rule and under his promise, or they are exiled. Or they have been rescued, 
or they're captives, or they are alive, or they're dead. And you can't be kind of halfway between in all of those things. See, God wants our undivided allegiance so that he can give us an undivided future, an eternity without end. Hezekiah tries to save his life. He does this by robbing the temple. But what he needed to do was to come humbly before God and demonstrate his loyalty to God and allow God to bring the results. But he doesn't do that. In fact, what Hezekiah kind of wants is he wants to gain the whole world and yet you see him forfeit his soul. And it did him no good because even the thought of gaining peace from his enemies demonstrated that he's actually lost faith in God. And in the end, his enemies come after him anyway. So don't be like Hezekiah. But even think about this of more significance is that Hezekiah is saved ultimately because of the promises that God has made to King David. And so when even when Hezekiah is unfaithful, God's heart is not divided. He has said what he will do and he has kept his covenant. He's still wholeheartedly committed to rescuing his people. And despite all of the unfaithfulness and even Hezekiah's own divided heart, ultimately God will bring salvation to his people. Um, it's all going to rest, of course, on the fact that God will be gracious, always preserving a remnant and ultimately sending his son to be the one whose heart is not divided and yet dies in our place. The message from these chapters is clear. Don't listen to the lies of something like Sennacherib, who comes with this wonderful flowery language about all the things that he can provide. But no nation and no idol can rescue us and bring full salvation. It is only in God where Israel will find their salvation. And so can we serve two masters? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, these chapters show us uh, what look like great beginnings, but they also show us what we are like, uh, that we are prone to wander. Um, Lord, we can feel it. And that idea that we might have a heart that gives itself to you, but at the same time hedges its bets. And so today, once again, we come echoing these thoughts, Lord, that we would not be those who would seek to gain the world and yet forfeit our soul. And so, Heavenly Father, we come humbly before you, knowing you to be the only true God. And would you help us this day and to lead us in that way that is everlasting. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.